Pete, uh, it's been several years since you flew in Gemini 11. You also flew in Gemini 5. This will be your third time in space. What's your reaction to a voyage as ambitious as this? Well, of course, I'm looking forward to it very much. Uh, this is uh, what we've uh, all been working for for the last seven years, really. The Gemini flights were preludes to this, and as you remember, Gemini 5, we uh, had uh, the objective to stay eight days, which was the minimum lunar trip. And, uh, of course, on 11, we did the M equal 1 rendezvous, which uh, is uh, uh, part of... Uh, learning how to do the rendezvous around the moon that uh, that we've worked out and developed and the rest of the guys have all done. So I'm looking forward to it with uh, uh, not so much uh, uh, anticipation uh, from uh, uh, the fact that it's exciting, but it's sort of the culmination of uh, seven years' worth of work. Well, let's discuss uh, you just a bit here. Where are you from originally? Uh, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And did you get your early education there? Yes, I went to uh, Haverford School in Haverford, Pennsylvania for 11 years, and I graduated from a boarding school up in New England uh, near Albany, New York, called the Darrow School. And mm -hmm. uh, then I went to Princeton University on a Navy scholarship and took aeronautical engineering. And that's how you got into the Navy and into flying, I presume? Right. I uh, went right straight from uh, graduation to flight training in the Navy. and. Spent uh, almost four years in a fighter squadron in Jacksonville, Florida. Then uh, I went to the Navy's test pilot school in uh, 1958. That's getting a while back. I have to scratch over the numbers. And uh, spent a year in armament test there and went back to the school as a uh, performance instructor and uh, uh, to teach uh, other Navy pilots how to be test pilots. And from there, I went to the West Coast and was in one of the first uh, Phantom Squadrons on the West Coast. And at that time, I uh, was accepted uh, in NASA as an astronaut in September of 1962, and I've been here ever since. And you've been an astronaut for seven years? Just a little over seven years. Yeah. Uh, is your wife from the Philadelphia area? No, she's from Texas. Uh, she was born in San Antonio, Texas, and her folks uh, live in Uvalde, Texas, which is about 300 miles from uh, Houston here, and so we uh, go out there quite often. Her father's a rancher, and uh, I think my children like that a lot better than their father because they have a grandfather that's a real cowboy. And, uh, <laughs> it's a lot more exciting than what I do as far as they're concerned, I think. How many children do you have? I have four what boys. Ages? Four boys? Oh, boy, I, they are probably little cowboys at this point. Yes, all of them are. All of them. What ages? They're 8, 10, 12, and 14. Are they more interested in being cowboys than possibly future astronauts? Well, uh, the, all four of them, like boys, are different, and uh, some of them are interested in flying right now, and some of them uh, are not. Uh, I have three playing football right at the moment, and uh, one that's not, so... Uh, uh, of course, they are old enough to be very interested in sports and uh, this sort of thing right now, and they do build models, and uh, one of them is very interested in uh, gas model airplanes and so forth, like I was. But uh, mm -hmm. certainly they are individuals, and they have different interests. Pete, I know that your family is going to be pulling for you in a big way. you got a good rooting team here on Earth while you're gone on Apollo 12. Yeah, I think so, and the boys are going to come to the Cape see the launch. Ah, good. They're going to watch it. Wonderful. Pete, would you describe the overall mission of Apollo 12? Well, I think the overall mission of Apollo 12 is starting a uh, second uh, generation of uh, flights. We've uh, worked very diligently to uh, achieve a lunar landing in the time frame that we set out. And uh, Apollo's 12 through 20... Uh, now have the job of uh, exploring the moon. And uh, our flight, I think, is uh, the first attempt at that, uh, to utilize the whole flight for that. We've uh, spent the majority of our training time on the lunar surface operation with respect to the scientific uh, accomplishments that are called out to be done on that flight, deploy the ALSAP package, and do the detailed lunar geology. Uh, it was sort of the uh, 
object of Apollo 11 to successfully work out the landing and uh, ascent procedures as the last part of the package that we worked on uh, through uh, Apollo 7 through 11. And uh, of course, I can't remember the number right now, but we are shifting over later on in the Apollo series to a three-day LEM, which will allow us even longer uh, useful lunar exploration. One of the other interesting things uh, right now uh, we feel that we have worked out our 32-hour lunar stay time to utilize uh, the maximum uh, that we have of that time to spend on the lunar surface, which is right now fixed at seven hours, and it may be open-ended longer than that in real time. Uh, I think it's interesting that, that a lot of our time in doing that is spent getting ready to get out for the time period and the amount of time that we spend uh, cleaning up after we come back in and then we have to go through the same cycle to get back out again. And one of the other things which uh, we hope to find out if we do open end our timeline is, uh, and I think that it's going to turn out this way, that it's probably better to get man all dressed and get him out on the lunar surface for what you would consider like a normal working day. Get him outside and let him stay out for seven or eight hours. Uh, now to do that along with this, uh, and I think to utilize the uh, the time most effectively in exploring the lunar surface uh, we need on the three-day lens to also develop the life support system which will allow us to stay out for the amount of time like six or seven hours. Mm -hmm. and you consider 12, uh, Apollo 12 a step in the direction of these developments you're yes, discussing? Yes, well I consider it uh, twofold. We're, we're, uh, we're really doing, uh, we should always be looking to the future and also we uh, and, and in that sense I think that our timeline and our EVA and what we accomplish in it will be an indicator of what we can do in the future when we have the longer stay lengths. And of course the other thing which is the most important thing in the object is to to uh, do the experiments in their order of priority which is the ALSAP first and uh, for those that are not familiar with it that's a pack package that will have a, uh, a nuclear generating source of of electrical power that will run four experiments for a year after we leave and transmit that data in real time back to Earth during that year whenever the scientists want to look at it. Mm -hmm. They do have the ability to turn it on and off. And uh, so it should run and send data back on our landing site for at least a year after we leave. And of course the other part is to do this uh, detailed uh, sampling of the lunar surface and bring back as many rocks that are detailed in the proper manner, uh, and we've spent a great deal of time of working on these procedures to get the proper photographs and the uh, uh, to tie the rocks into the proper context from which they came, and so forth. And, uh, and that's pretty much really the difference between uh, 12 and 11. We we really are looking for this useful work period on the moon. That's what we're going for. What do you think is the most important thing that you have gained from 11? for use in your flight? I think the most important thing that we gained from 11 was uh, we were working on this flight prior to the time 11 landed and I made an assumption that uh, their simulations of the lunar surface operations and uh, that, uh, that their uh, input into making the landing, the procedures for making the landing and the ascent would be good enough uh, based on their homework and from what we observed of their lunar surface operations and from what they told us that we wouldn't have to change any of the things that we were doing. In other words, I built our whole lunar surface plan around a successful Apollo 11. And as it turned out, Apollo 11 was successful both in the landing and in the lunar surface operation. At least man got out. We didn't, we didn't have the parent fatigue problems that we had in the early Gemini EVAs, which said we learned our uh, our homework, our simulations were good. It looked to us that while we were doing our simulations, the lunar surface work in 11 was, that we weren't going to have any problems, but we'd been bitten a few times before, so we were a little suspicious. And I can remember sitting in a control center watching them uh, do the experiments that, that they were doing and that I was very, very familiar with and seeing that it went so well that uh, I was very excited that night in the fact that it was going to make no change to all the work we had done up to that time. Really confidence in your own procedure. Very, very good, yeah. That was very reassuring. Pete, uh, one of your most ambitious undertakings during your excursion of the moon will hopefully be to find the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. How do you plan to go about this? 
Uh, do you mean how do we plan to make the spot landing or uh, what we're going to do with it uh, if we find it? <laughs> Let's take both okay. cases. Well, we, we have analyzed the errors from Apollo 11 and tried to uh, incorporate this knowledge into our procedures so that we don't have these downrange errors that were apparent there. And we've changed the computer program so that we can update the targeting late in the flight. Uh, when they see the errors after DOI that are, are always inherent, you're bound to have some errors to clean up our, our targeting and our navigation. Now, uh, also, when we pitch over at 7,000 feet, I hope to be able to have enough knowledge of the terrain from the photographs that are being provided of us when we're going in there to recognize uh, right away whether we're off in cross range or down range, and I have uh, two manners of uh, I can either go automatically to the computer and, and change the, the targeted landing site, or I can manually fly over there. And we probably plan to do a little bit of both mm -hmm. uh, if all goes well. Well, once you get there, and hopefully into Pete's Park, as we're hearing it called, uh, how would this traverse by you and Bean into the crater where Surveyor is located be carried out? Well, there, there are two possibilities. And the first one is that, that we do land close enough that it's really right at hand. And when I say right at hand, within three or four hundred feet, then there's the possibility that for some reason or another it is close enough for us to walk to, but it's not readily at hand. It's say 2,000, 2,500 feet. In the uh, uh, latter case, we would plan our geology traverse so that at some point in that traverse we would wind up at the surveyor. And we, in other words, that's the most efficient way to utilize the time and just walking to it would be to do this documented sample in a route to the surveyor mm -hmm. and back from it. And of course the other is, is we can run a traverse anywhere we want to and come back to the spacecraft, leave the rocks, and then just wander over to the surveyor, which says we landed very, very close to it. In either event, when we get there, uh, I have a set of cutters that will be uh, on the back of my pliss that Al put on there that are carried on the uh, external package that we carry equipment on, the Mesa. Is this a hand cutting tool? Yes, it's a large set of bolt cutters is what mm -hmm. it, it amounts to. And we have a bag. And uh, aside from the photographic uh, information that we should bring back about the surveyor, and Al is going to take the photographs, one of the most interesting things would be the photographs taken very close to the same position that the TV camera took the close f photographs, and then people would have these two photographs to compare 31 months apart, see the effects of, of uh, what happens to the lunar surface over 31 months. The other thing which would be interesting, and we have uh, four items which we're going to try and retrieve off the surveyor with the bolt cutters, and uh, that is we don't need to bolt cutters for the glass, but there's some thermal glass that was mounted on it as a thermal shield. And this glass has been sitting out for 31 months exposed to micrometeorites, and uh, we can bring the glass back for them to examine. And the other thing that would be interesting would be a polished aluminum tube, which is relatively easy to cut off, which also has been exposed both to micrometeorites and the solar wind and uh, would be a, a, uh, a useful bit of information to bring back, sort of a 31-month-long uh, solar wind experiment. And then there is the TV camera that is mounted on there that has some cabling to it. Now, they would like us to cut a sample of the cable off and put it in an uh, organically pure container and bring it back, <coughs> excuse me, which would... Uh, uh, allow the organic scientists to see what happened to the Earth's bacteria and uh, that has been carried out on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not completely clean when it left the Earth. And the last thing is the TV camera, which is a multitude of, of different kinds of parts. It's got uh, electronic parts in it. It has various metals that are painted, uh, anodized, not coated, uh, insulation, uh, just all kinds of materials that are essential to building uh, space vehicles. By bringing back that TV camera for analysis, the engineers would get a very good handle on the effects uh, of long duration exposure to the space environment on materials and uh, would crank this into obviously later designs of both unmanned and manned satellites that you, you want to stay up and operate for a long time. So these are the, the bonus benefits that we'd get by making a spot landing next